lot of beautiful saints and mystics throughout the centuries, and um, a lot of them were pretty reclusive. Um, you know, they went through a lot of the dark night of the soul, St. John of the Cross, and they wrote about it, and it was daunting, you know, when they described the darkness they went through, it was just like gut-wrenching, and, and it wasn't like those were popular books, it wasn't like St. John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul has ever been on, you know, the, the New York Times bestseller list. It's usually for those of us that, that somehow find ourselves drawn into this new, this pathway to know who we are. Like the Greeks said, know thyself. We really find ourselves uh, unmistakably drawn to, to experience the truth of who we are and our identity. And then when we go deeper into it, it's, it's the darkness rises up. But Jesus was, he was a public mystic. He was a public mystic, especially those three years. It was a very public ministry. He was very transparent, and the stuff that came out of his mouth was, was earth-shattering. It was absolutely not in this world. And, and even since 2,000 years ago, it's just been like a, a shockwave in this world. You know, there's still reverberations going on. Um, uh, I just watched this movie called God's Not Dead, and it was kind of inspired by all these lawsuits all over the, the country between universities and, and Christian organizations that are, you know, just wanting to talk about Christ and meet and join and everything. And, and there's this reactions of the ego to such a bright, unconditional, loving light just are, are like tidal waves. They continue to go on. The light of Christ kind of hitting this planet would be like a meteor hitting a big meteor hitting the ocean. It's a big tidal wave over everything. That's psychologically, that's kind of how it is. The ego is the belief that there is no God, that there is no love, that there is no light. And the light, you might say that perfect love casts out fear, but you have to bring all the darkness up to awareness to that light before it disappears. So that's really the, the journey. But I will tell you that this journey is not a journey of sacrifice at all. That's just a belief of the ego. A belief that we somehow have to give up something good and real and important to know who we are. Or good and real and important just to experience peace of mind is, is ridiculous. I feel the deeper I went into the Course, it just got deeper and steeper, and I thought, I was like hanging on to Jesus, like, I'm barely hanging on here. This is like turning everything I believe right side up. It's been upside down, and now it's going right side up, and it's, it was quite tumultuous, as Kirsten was saying. It, was, uh, it wasn't fun. And my pathway was more traditional, in the sense that it was seen to be many years of just facing things. I didn't really do it so much with relationships in the early years, or with, didn't have a lot of white companions around me, but um, wow, when I broke free of the limits of the ego, I thought, I'm going to shine this, I'm going to share this to the whole world, I'm going to make it easy for everyone. Um, whatever I had to go through to pop through this, this darkness, um, I'm going to let the light shine and make so many tools and resources words, I'll travel, I'll do whatever you want to make this as, as quick and easy for everyone. Because how could you not, if you experience such love and joy, you want to give it away. So if you find the way, if you find the pathway, you want to share that pathway. It's, it's what love does, it just wants to share, to make it easy for, for everyone. So what we found is our lives are, are quite unusual by what you might say, traditional standards, but not so much in the form. We, we don't really live secluded lives. Um, we are extremely available, and people can feel the presence and the love that comes through because we meet with people, and we, you know, we were invited today to, on the way here to Erie, Pennsylvania, you know, stop and have breakfast with me, and we did. You know, very, very joyful. We're very, very 
accessible mystics. Uh, you know, we're like, okay, Bob Evans, okay, we'll leave it. Uh, and we had a wonderful breakfast, but we're very, very, very accessible. Also, we're very accessible through all the channels uh, of modern technology. People call to us, they write to us, they Skype us, they Facebook us, instant message us. It just comes in all kinds of ways. They come and, and they live with us. I'm having a happy time, and now these are three of them. How many? You count them like 30? It's, I'm all over the world, so I have many friends. I live with many people in many different places. People ask, ask me, but can you, can you buy locate? I say, buy locate? That's, I'm all over the place. I'm in people's dreams. People are right. looking at me on one day, there's two or three people say, you were in my dreams, I said, and somebody else says, you were in my dreams, and you were, wow, see, I'm, I'm multi-located, <laughs> and I'm not even trying to do it, you know, I'm just showing up in people's dreams and helping them through things, and it's fun, I mean, that's really a lot of fun, too, you don't, you're not in one place, you really start to see that this is just a symbol, and that's why some of the mystics and saints have appeared to people dreams and visions to help out, because it's just symbols. Our mind just needs symbols that we can relate to. You get to a certain point, too, it's really freeing when you start to realize that people aren't people. They're thoughts. Everyone in your life is a thought. And, and it's not there by accident. You've drawn forth these witnesses to you. They're just acting out everything that you believe in. And as soon as you start to realize it's your own beliefs and your own thoughts, then well, you're not going to be blaming anybody. You're going to be thanking everybody. Because whether they're, they're acting out loving, kind, compassionate thoughts, or even if they're acting out the dark thoughts that you need to forgive and release, you're going to be grateful for even them acting out the darkness. Because it's going to bring it up into awareness and show you where you need to release. So, as Jesus says in the Course, you know, only gratitude is an appropriate response to your brother. Both gratitude. Both for his love and his calls for love. We, we can thank our brothers and our sisters both for their love and for their calls for love. Because both are capable of bringing love into our awareness. If we allow it. If we let the Spirit use them. And you know how it is in relationships. I mean, there's so much mirroring that goes on. You know, if you had children, if you had spouses, you know, there's a lot of intense mirroring that goes on. When you live in community, I've lived in a lot of different spiritual communities over the years, and that's magnifying the, the mirroring. When you share a house with a group of people, or in our case of our monastery, it's like 49 acres. It's, there's a lot of mirrors that uh, go on in the 49 acres. But, and then when you do a lot of traveling like I do, and you're staying with people, mirrors, mirrors, mirrors. I have to thank all the mirrors, the, the many, many thousands of mirrors in my life, because they really sped things up from my early days of trying to meditate my way through everything, to, oh, in my face, oh, that needs to be forgiven, oh, I need to forgive that. You know, it just kept coming at me. But I really got out of the grievance mode of, you know, blaming trying to get rid of people, and trying to get away from people. I just, I just was blessed when I realized that they all had a gift. Everyone had a gift, was bringing me a gift. So, that's, that's what you'll be hearing tonight from us. Also, so much, when you really clear your mind of all the resistances, and all of the judgments, and the debris, then the fruits of the Spirit come through. I never sought out, I sought to write books, or do anything. I I was not a traveler. I was one of those kids, you know, are we there yet? You know, when the parents take you on a trip, and my sister and I, we didn't like to travel. It was hot, long travel. We would make our parents have motels with pools before we didn't get in the car, because it was just, it just was boring. But I never liked to travel, and now I've been traveling for over a quarter of a century. Um, I was very shy, I was voted most quiet in my senior class. Um, I was a wallflower and I didn't speak, I avoided people. I didn't have friends, maybe in high school I might have had 
could count my friends on one hand. And, and yet I was very, still very quiet and reserved and was kind of closed with them. And then the Spirit got a hold of me and just flipped everything around. It's like Moses stuttered, oh, you're going to deliver the Ten Commandments? David's shy, oh, we're going to use you all over the world. You're going to be a speaker of truth. What? My parents told me never talk about God or politics. And <laughs> uh, now I mostly talk about God, but I bring in some political examples. Maybe not mainly to, to use that as a mechanism, but more to forgive the idea that you, you have to make changes in the world to find peace of mind. It's really you make this shift internally and you find the peaceful perception. So I, I just want to open it up to you. We have so much amazing music that is poured through the fruits of the Spirit. And we have, it's just amazing to me, this tour is called the Quantum Love Tour. Most every stop we end up, they sing like the theme song, Quantum Love, which came through them. It's just an amazing song. And, um, and Akita is just so happy. She's just sparkling. And she's like a little 12 year old kid, just all sparkly and happy and waking up in the middle of the night with new insights or not able to sleep. She just gets so happy she can't sleep uh, and, or eat. She'll sometimes forget to eat. You know, it's just not, uh, oh, well, yeah, yeah, food, food. It's just, there's so much joy going there that it's like the things that seem to be so important in the human experience to start to fade away. Appetites fade away. You know, the joy just lights your mind up so bright that, that you don't really feel human. Um, it's quite common, too, among our group. We've been at this for some time, so deep meditations, losing awareness of time and space, losing awareness of the body. Um, there's a part in the Course where it says, you, can, you will tell you practice well by this. The body should not feel at all. The body should not feel. You start to realize that your mind tells the body what to feel. That your body is really just like a puppet that just responds to the mind. And when you clear away your grievances and your judgments, and you come to that inner peace, amazingly, you have these deep experiences and mystical experiences where you absolutely lose track of the body completely. Uh, some of you might have had that experience in a deep meditation. And beyond this perceptual world is a world of light. Uh, and of course, in America, it's called Revelation or the Great Rays with a capital G and R. I've had a few of those experiences where the whole world kind of went from three dimensional to figure ground, two dimensional, and then I guess pierced the veil completely. And in piercing the veil, I think we have a song about something about piercing the veil or lifting the veil. This was like piercing the veil, where it was like, it was like getting. Hit with it. If somebody turned like a fire hose on you in your forehead with just light. <laughs> That's what it felt like. It was like this blazing light. And then the whole world just disappeared. And it was like, oh, that is what reality is. Reality is light, pure love and light. And this these shadows that we call life is not have nothing to do with eternal life at all. This is just part of the veil. It's been drawn all over the mind, you know, to keep it from knowing the truth. But I had those experiences, and, and once I did, I just, I really lit up. I thought, well, this is going to be fun. I'm just going to let the Spirit use all the symbols of the world. I started scribing books, like Movie Watcher's Guide to Life. People are tired of, of all these rituals. They want something fun. If they could have a pathway to just sit and watch movies and wake up to God, they would take it. And then, yeah, I took it. I took, I've watched thousands of movies, and now I have tools online that, that use movie watching to take you back into spirit, music, all kinds of different tools, and it just goes on and on and on. And they're fun. I have to say, I really enjoyed watching movies to wake up. I enjoyed watching movies already, but I was, the ego was using it a bit for escapism and entertainment. And the Spirit said, no, oh, I have a little few tweaks here, and we can make use of this thing. I enjoyed playing tennis, playing golf, that turned into my Tai Chi, you know, the golf and the tennis. Everything that we like, everything that we're interested in in this world can be tilted and 
given over to the Spirit, and the Spirit will use it because we enjoy it, will take us back to God in an enjoyable way. It doesn't have to be like this, you know, woe is me, this, this penance and this punishment and this sacrifice. That's, that is not the way. Punishment never gets you anywhere. It's not even an idea, the concept that God even knows about. It's not required at all. You want your whole life just to be transported. You want to just be in that experience. You know, like that song, Love Lift Us Up Where We Belong. Just to feel alive, to feel connected, to feel happiness and joy. Not happiness based on some worldly reason. Happiness for no reason at all. Just a state of being. A natural state of being. Something that you don't have to do to maintain. Something that just is. It's who you are. And really that's that's what all spiritual practice is. It's, it's letting yourself be done through. You don't go from being a person and a doer into pure beingness, you have to go through a phase of being done through. Like that song that's like channeled from spirit. You, can, you lose track, there's no performer. It's not a performance. You just feel a resonance just in your heart. A recognition of what that is. And, and a life of devotion is just simply allowing yourself to be done through, sung through, spoken through, danced through, smiled through, laughed through, just hugged through, you know, just the simple joys of life that we all know, we've all experienced. It's, it's not, it can't be complicated to yield into that flow, that spirit. It's so natural. It's the, it's the most natural experience to be love extending. The Beatles sang about it. Then it's got his Beatles t-shirt on. <laughs> All we need is love. Da, 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 da. You know, we've heard it. We've heard it, we've heard it. And now it's where we get to give ourselves permission to just experience that. And we do that through forgiveness, you know. It's, it's not the forgiveness of forgiving somebody for what they've done, or forgiving somebody for that they should have done something different or something like that. It's really just releasing all attack thoughts, emptying your mind of, of attack thoughts and grievances. Being a beautiful vessel for love and light. You know? and, and lately I've been talking about this uh, teaching in the Song of Prayer from Jesus where he italicizes four words. When Jesus italicizes words, I like that. I'm like, okay. He's making a point. But I remember the first time I read those four italicized words was, do not see error. Do not see error. Oh my God. If I get this one, that's going to be perfect innocence. I, oh, I'm going to be just living in bliss, sparkling if I get, do not see error. No, do not make it real. And that's where you need the Spirit. You need say Christian terms, the Holy Spirit, or you could say the Spirit. You need the Spirit for that one because human beings are not capable of do not see error. They're part of the construct. They're part of the matrix. They're part of, they were made by the ego. Human beings were made by the ego. You know, we, we read the Bible, Genesis in the beginning, that God created the heavens and the earth. And now we're starting to get a little more in tune, where we see God, heavens, eternity, spirit, love, joy, peace, happiness, yes, 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 yes. The linear time-space construct that we call Earth is, you don't have to worry about burning in an eternal hell. If you're perceiving linear time, you, have, you are perceiving hell. <laughs> it doesn't get any worse. <laughs> we don't have to try to worry about eternal fires, because there aren't any. It's just the day-to-day -day human life, those little pains and annoyances, those little expectations, the struggles, the challenges, that as you go through every day facing a new wave of struggles and challenges, a new wave of predicaments, that's hell. That's what hell is. 
And when you surrender to spirit and you are done through, you find your function, you find your calling, you find your purpose. Hallelujah. Then the joy is so natural. You know, you don't waste words. You let the spirit, you know, speak the words for you. I had a mailing list called Awakening in Christ and I, I don't know, maybe for 12, 13 years I've been answering questions and things, but I, I started off with Beloved One. It's, it always comes out. It's the most natural thing. I really feel like I'm just writing to myself. Somebody told me that David means Beloved, so really I'm writing to myself. <laughs> uh, beloved One. So I would write Beloved One, Beloved One. And I mean, people would pour their hearts out because they, they felt that I would never, ever, ever judge them for anything that they share with me. So they write to me pour their hearts out, long, sometimes long emails, just, but underneath all the words was, please help me, help me, help me, and the love in my heart just poured out, starting with the love of one, and then that turned into a book called Healing in Mind, and these things just turned into books and videos and MP3s and all kinds of things, but it's just been letting the love in our hearts pour through. Because that's how we stay in the awareness of love, is by giving it away. Giving and receiving are the same. To give is to receive. It's not, one is not better than the other. We're always giving and extending and we're receiving. As you sow, so shall you reap. You know, it's, it's right there. We've known this. Karma. It's the same thing. Extend love, joy, happiness, and receive the reflections. Yeah, and I just was reminiscing you sharing about the experience that I've been having um, more and more lately is just, I'm either activated by the spirit or I'm not. Like, just like a puppet. And when I'm activated, it's like these movements and the action and the words are coming. And then when I'm not activated, it's just a very deep, restful place where my mind is just very still. And I feel like I couldn't, I couldn't move myself if I tried. I'm not meant to. Who, who is it that would want to? You know? And at first that was scary because it was part of my mind saying, but what if I want to? You know, what if I'm meant to be doing something? And the more I've just kind of surrendered over to it, it's just, it's just, you know, the ultimate rest. And then watching where something comes from there. And the do not see error is just such a deep teaching and something that we've been putting into practice um, so much um, recently. And it's because really to see error is to try to make the world real. I mean, to, to see error is, it's really judgment. Because um, if, you, if you're judging something is wrong or something could be different, it's already been judged, and then it's trying to fix that or change that or point out that it's wrong. And it's, it's really just a way of maintaining the past or maintaining the world. And the more we come into this accepting that there is only one responsibility, <coughs> only one, it's accepting the atonement for ourself. In other words, it's just accepting the spirit and replacement for that judgment. That's it. One responsibility, peace of mind, like receive the gift, receive the loving voice. In that washing, in the end, you realize that you couldn't, you can't really judge. Anyway, like even that attempt to try to judge or hold on or make it real, it's just like some activity in mind that was just holding on. It doesn't even make any sense holding hold on to what in the end when it just gets it gets loosened and loosened. Um, everything just gets very, very simple.
experience of coming towards one lupus. Really seeing it is a split lupus and experiencing it. Yeah, I love how it all is. And sometimes I'll be telling a parable or something and talking to somebody and, and then I'll think, I don't, but I don't even know that story. And then I'm, I'm witnessing it come out. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it, it's that involuntary nature of being done through. It's moving into that more and more and more and more. Yeah, and that's really what the ego is afraid of. Because in that involuntary nature, it's like the ego is afraid of the pain of it. There is no secret self that has control. And you're not drawing on past learning or past memory at all. You're not drawing on like the, the last way you did something. You're just completely um, yeah, being done through. There's just a flow of the spirit coming through. And when you experience it, and I'm sure everyone's experienced it to some degree, whether it's through you know, running or sports of some kind, so inside that it's just happening you know, through you, you just become so intuitive. Or you know, music, channeling, counseling, you just some profound thing comes through you and someone's saying, oh, thank you. What did I say? That's it. And when you experience it a lot, it doesn't make any sense that there's a fear of it. It's the most natural thing in the world. So it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> if the ego doesn't make any sense, you know, it's the ego that's afraid. Um, and in the end, what you realize is that there isn't really even an ego that's afraid. It's more just fear. It's just kind of fear of the light, fear of the love that's just sort of moving through, moving through the mind. So our whole community just about these opportunities to um, let go of that personal control, let go of using our past references to, for everything. And so things are always changing. Um, if you spoke to anyone in our community, you know, at some point they would say, can I please just be given a project to do or a task to do that I really know how to do? <laughs> So I can feel good and successful. But it's, um, yeah, we're going for something much deeper. We're actually getting the spirit of thrills. We're that self that you know, has this pseudo safety or pride of um, having it all handled and being really good at something. And that's getting washed. And at first it's very humbling. But it's just so beautiful to just have that wash happen. And you're just so amazed at what the spirit can do through you. Now, some of you are familiar with the serenity prayer. And oftentimes I just say, of course, the remembrance is just an expanded version of the serenity prayer. It's really super simple. But there's just, you know, there's just three elements to the serenity prayer, you know, what you what you can change, what you cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. And it's really, it does come down to control in the end of thinking you have control over anything or anyone, even the body. It's all part of a deception to think that you can control your behavior. That you can actually, by force of thought, gain weight or lose weight, or do this or do that, it's all, the body is part of a prearranged script. The script is written. And it's all part of a destiny. And really, true surrender is just getting back, 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 back in your mind to the point where you are just a witness. You're just a witness. You can see the sameness of everything in the world, but you, you start to realize you have absolutely no control over the world. That's a line from A Course in Miracles. You have no control over the world you made. Jesus is kind of speaking to the ego. But he's also speaking to your mind, saying, if you want to be really happy, I mean, so, so, so happy, completely, eternally happy, you have to first realize that you have no control over the world you made. 
That's why we can't fix people. That's why we can't change people. We can't even change the person, the personality. It seems like the personality can undergo changes and we buy a hook, line, and sinker to become better people. You know, we spend the whole life trying to better ourselves. Except God doesn't create people. God created spirit. The personality is the mask. What persona comes from the, the Latin mask. And a mask just covers over who you are. You were created perfect by God. And the mask is a cover over that perfection. So we're really here to forgive the mask. Not, the, not just the personality mask of ourselves and others, but to forgive the whole cosmic mask that's covering over this light and love that we truly are, that we are eternal. And that's what piercing the veil is, and, and that's also this sense when you really see that you have no control over the world, then you, you ease into this involuntary nature of miracles. Everything is involuntary. Imagine how peaceful that is when you start to realize that everything is involuntary. And, and it just always amazes me, it's miraculous. I think in the last time, we have this Strawberry Feels Forever music and enlightenment retreat. Um, every, every year, it's going to be our third year. It's going to be August 27th to September 3rd. And I remember I was sitting there in the audience, I was a few rows back, and and Charles was up on stage, and he, he can make all kinds of sounds, and he does all kinds of fun variations. And he kept looking down, and he said, you, come up, come up, come up. He, went, he, was, going, he was calling someone up to come and do something. It was hip-hop, and um, what else does he do? So, beatbox and rap. And he was calling me up <laughs> to do. Hip hop rap. <laughs> so I just got up there and amazingly, thank God, everything is involuntary. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing like being called on the stage to do that. And I just went up and it was fun. You know, when, you, when you pull up at the, uh, the parking lot of our monastery out there in the Canyon in Utah, we've got a picture of Jesus with arms outstretched. It says something like trust. Settles every problem. It's, it's a variation of the Course of Miracles teaching from Jesus. Trust would settle every problem now. If you really start to give your mind over to that, you can start to feel a joy coming up. Trust would settle every problem now. Because it's again, it's teaching us that, that this has been a time problem that we're told in A Course in Miracles, that time and eternity cannot coexist. There's something that is true about that. If eternity is forever, if eternity is changeless, it's endless. You know, we have a word for it. We actually have a word in the English language called eternity. But, but there's no experience of eternity. There's no experience in this cosmos of eternity. Everything has a beginning and an end. Everything is changing. There's no changelessness in this. Now, we, the more we find out about, you know, the, the galaxies, the stars, you know, it was very romantic, I love you, as long as the stars shine in heaven. We know they're burning gases, they're going to burn out. You can't even propose with something like that anymore. Because everyone's too sophisticated now. Is that all? You know? That's finite. You could, you're offering me a finite love I can do better than. And the love of God is, is what's real, but there's nothing here that's eternal. So trust would settle every problem now. Doesn't that sound like an invitation to go inside your heart and find perfect trust? Because that would be the solution to any conceivable problem you can think of. That's, that fits in with do only that. It fits in with just give, give it your all. Go for it completely. Don't go for it half-heartedly. Don't think that you can kind of compromise with the truth. The truth is true and only the truth is true. That's another teaching from the workbook of A Course in Miracles. Jesus says, you must accept both parts to realize the truth. The 
truth is true and only the truth is true. <laughs> truth doesn't have exceptions. Truth doesn't have an opposite. But that, it's going to take trust to know that state of mind. We're going to have to really exercise our trust. And that's the fun, I think, for me and for, for all of us. Um, like I said, I was in university, I went through the typical things on planet Earth, and then when I found the Course in 1986, I got a sense that even though it was a big book of 31 chapters and 1,200 and some pages, I got a sense that really the whole thing was just about getting in touch with the internal teacher, getting in touch with the Spirit, and following guidance of the Spirit. That as soon as I would make contact with the Spirit, and I would really be able to hear the Spirit's instructions for me, that effectively my need for A Course in Miracles would be over. The book, the words would have done their job. If I could just get in touch with the internal teacher, life would be easy, life would be joyful, life would be fun. Imagine having the Spirit of the universe, you know, the universal spirit giving you instructions, and imagine yourself so willing to just follow those instructions, whatever they were, without exception. That's, that's like a pathway to joy, a pathway to love and happiness. And it's, nothing's at random. Everything that comes to you is, is part of that one lesson. So now I have to say that I enjoy the reflections and I enjoy meeting my brothers and sisters all over the world that are telling me their stories of tuning in, of hearing guidance, of hearing, feeling prompts from the Spirit. I love to hear cascading witnesses of people that are living intuitive lives, not lives based on past learning, but they're becoming intuitive. And, and with our community, we have different, we had one over in Spain for a while, and one over Canada, Hawaii, Mexico, they're all just tuning in to this internal listening. That's where the songwriting comes from. Kirsten and Ricky just recently, right before this tour, that there was a, a CD that came out of all these songs. It's given. It's really the Spirit gives it to you. Everything. The key to living your life. The people in our communities living based on intuitive inner listening. It's breaking away from models of leader-follower kind of inform. You know, like with convents and monastery, you know, you listen to the abbot, you listen to the monsignor, you listen to the cardinal or the bishop or the priest or the rabbi. What about your internal listening? What about your connection with source? Or the monasteries, there's, there's mother superior, you know? You could do this and this and this, but you better run it by Mother Superior. <laughs> you know. But what if you have that same intuitive voice in you? And what if you can connect with that, and you can increasingly connect with that, and you know you're increasingly connecting with it by how you feel? By when you become more consistently peaceful, happy, joyful, that's it. That's your experiential evidence right there. Your state of mind is the evidence of how tuned in you are to that intuitive listening. And what if you could be a hundred percent intuitive? What if you got to the point where you became so intuitive that you didn't react and respond to any of the images of the world? You weren't being informed by form. You said, no, no, I'm not going to pay attention to the form anymore. I'm going to tune in in my heart, and listen to what that small still voice is telling me. That's what the workbook of A Course in Miracles is doing. It starts off with lesson number one. Nothing I see means anything. It's beginning a rinsing and a washing of this addiction to thinking that, that who we are comes from what the world is telling us, from the images. Even believing that in this dream that that we began with mom and dad, you know, that the source of our being, the source of our existence was mom and dad. You notice Jesus never said that to go through the Gospels? He never gives credit to Mary and Joseph, not even once, in four Gospels. 
you never see a thank you in it. <laughs> oh, I tell you, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And thank you, Mom. <laughs> it's, it's just because the presence, the source, is the creator, is the I am presence, you know, is the spirit. And he gave all the glory to the spirit. And his teachings were so profound because he was he was he was being sourced by God. You know, I and the Father are one. He was basically saying we are the same spirit, not the flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's what the born again experience. It's not just saying the name is Jesus Christ. I believe upon Jesus Christ and going along with your earthly life. It's actually having that feeling of merge where your will as the Christ and God's will are the are one. So you even go past not my will but thy will be done. You actually come into ex an experience of perfect happiness where my will is thy will. That you actually share the same will with God. Doesn't that make more sense than thinking that God has a different will than you? What must you be? If God created you and you have a different will than God, why would God do that? I am almighty and I'm happy and joyful, but I'm going to give you a different will. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> but no, every moment, every day, it's like, do I want the problem or do I want the answer? Every moment of every day is an opportunity to really come into an experience of who your source is, or that YouTube video that I have, somebody labeled it, Who's Your Daddy? Yeah. <laughs> I saw that one time I'm going through my YouTube channel. That's a good title. I'm going to have to watch that one. Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> is your daddy the ego? A belief in separation, a belief in liberalness, fear, guilt, shame. Is that your daddy? As long as we stay identified with these personality selves, we're answering Who's Your Daddy? with the ego, with limitation, lack, sin, guilt, fear, pain. That's, that's not our inheritance. It's, we're, we're worth everything. We're worth everything. And it's so practical. Life is so fun, but it's all because it's sourced. You're just given the symbols that you need for a while. You're given anything you need. If you need a word, you're given it. If you need whatever. Traveling around, you know, we're, we've been so beautifully hosted. I think it's I didn't know why this was so you know, good to come up here. That's I think you've got a yeah, it's perfect. We were waiting for, waiting for that. That microphone is there waiting for someone to um, I, I, I resonate strongly with, with you know, these, uh, these words that they're showing us. What I struggle with is this idea of karma. What you come into with and what limitations you have and, and, and overcoming those, um, how that can be maybe a different path for this person than the other, but I don't know if you can, I don't really know if I have a question in that, but we you just reflect on that? Thanks. That karma, that karma question comes up and it's 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 if as if you have done some things in the past and, and there are consequences to those things that were done that, that have to be undone or have to be resolved in some way. And um, I would say it's a version of as you sow, so shall you reap. And and in the context of reincarnation, it's like things seem to loop like Groundhog Day, just loop around and around and around. You keep making the same mistakes until you don't. Like in Groundhog Day, when he finally recognizes there's a puddle in front of him, and he stepped in the puddle all those consecutive days, and then he notices the puddle, and he goes over the puddle, and from that point on, he never steps in that puddle. That would almost be like a, a karmic kind of healing of recognizing something and then not falling into the pit. Now, with the Course in Miracles, it's such a deep teaching that 
And basically when we say do not see error, or we talk about atonement or forgiveness, it's saying that you have the power at this very instant to bring an end to the error. Do I want the problem or do I want the answer? And the answer would be the end of the karmic wheel. It would be the end of error. Even karma in a reincarnational sense is you just keep learning your lessons and healing and, and healing your errors until you reach perfection. You go back to God in the future. And what the Course is teaching us is that even the future is a construct. It's part of the error. That the ego invented linear time and put the present moment in between the past and the future as this little ineffectual little blip. And then it tells you that you have no power in the present, you're guilty in the past, and you're going to be guilty in the future. And it therefore seals up this misperception of guilt. And the teachings, like Jesus would say, before Abraham was, I am, really the teachings are, is the present moment is not between the past and the future, it's actually before time was. It's, it's actually prior to time. Innocence is prior to linear time. So, I'm always staying open to these things myself, and again, Dennis has the Beatles. I went to the wise sage, sage John Lennon for the song, did anybody ever hear John Lennon's song, Instant Karma? Ooh, what an interesting idea. John Lennon sings about instant karma. Instant karma is going to get you. Going to knock you right in the head. Better get yourself together, pretty soon you're going to be dead. Why in the world are we here? You don't have to live in pain and fear. And why in the world are you there when you're everywhere? Going to get your shit. The song is great because what it's doing is it's taking the karma idea, which is cause and consequence, and it's, it's bringing it all back again to the present moment, which is our point of decision. That the only reason that in time these errors, this karmic error seems to go on, the wheel of time seems to go on, is because Jesus says, you, your main mistake is you keep making the same mistake in the present. You, you keep drawing upon the past, <laughs> and you're drawing upon the past as if it's still here, as if you can still access memory in the past, but it's gone. He even comes out and says, this world was gone long ago. So it's almost like we're in some kind of a memory loop, an imaginary memory loop. It reminds me of a Star Trek episode, too. There was a Star Trek episode, I think it was Star Trek Next Generation, where every time the crew would go through all these different things, and they would get to the same point, and the ship would blow up. And then they'd find themselves back in this loop, and they'd go through the same kind of circumstances, and the ship would blow. And they'd go through the same thing again, and, they'd come, and then the ship would blow. And then they started to notice that they were in some kind of a, a loop, a time loop, in which the ship kept blowing up. So they decided to join together, and they said, we've got to stop this. We've got to do something different. We don't know what we have to do differently. We've got to do something different. And so, they, they relied on data, you know, the, the android, the, the non-human, they, they said, you, you notice when these things start to happen, you tell us these things are starting to happen and we're going to make another decision. And that's eventually how they got out of it. They got to a point where the ship didn't blow up. But they needed to be triggered that there was some kind of a mistake going on that they weren't recognizing so that they could make a different choice. That's really what A Course in Miracles is saying, is saying, I'll train your mind to get to a point where you will transcend the error, you'll get out of the groundhog loop of time, you won't keep making the same mistake. Because time is the problem, and that's where karma comes in. And if you just look at time, you could, you could make a really good case for karma, because it just seems like past repeats and past mistakes repeat over and over. You've heard people give testimonies. Why is it that I had three spouses and I kept marrying an alcoholic? Why can I, why did I keep attracting an alcoholic? You think I could 
learned from the first one, but I did it again and again. It's the same kind of karmic cosmic loop that goes on until we can recognize the mistake. Now what we do in our community is basically, that's where all this sharing of private thoughts comes in, letting all the unconscious up. Instead of just pushing things down and trying to brush over things, let, let it come to the surface. Talk about it. We need to, to be inspired by the Spirit to openly bring everything up from the darkness to the light, so that we don't follow this unconscious pattern of just making the same mistake over and over and over. And in one sense, it's like that movie Tron, where he basically pulls all the projections of his entire life back, the Father does. And that's a great moment of forgiveness. So, it's exciting. It's like the adventure of bringing an end to karma. That's a challenge, you know, when you look at how deep the pattern seems to be, to bring an end to karma is exciting. I was excited about it. I was, I was singing that instant karma song. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, how do you pull out an unconscious belief if you're not conscious of it? So how, therefore, does one become conscious of an unconscious? Yeah, that, that was my number one thing, because when I was in the parable of David, when I was young, I would, I would look at this really I was kind of like a zombie. I, I think I looked at my yearbook pictures and my eyes were half closed. <laughs> I had this look on my face like I didn't want the future to come. <laughs> Nothing looked appealing. I wanted out of this world and everything. You see that in your yearbook picture, you know, your eyes half shut. So then finally I, I get into my 20s and I start to go, mm hmm, it's this unconscious shadow that Young talked about. This unconscious belief system, and how do I bring yes. this up to the surface? So that became my passion. I thought, I'm going to go at that with everything. I'm going to do anything. And so I prayed to the Spirit, and the Spirit said, Well, I'll take you to the movies. The, the music was really helpful too, because I would listen to all this music and it would evoke all these emotions. You know, I would be crying and bring up all these emotions. I'm like, I'm feeling. I'm feeling, I'm finally feeling, this is wonderful. And then I would go to the movies, and I would be guided to which movies to watch, and that would bring up. So I found all these kind of tools and techniques at bringing the unconscious up into awareness. And then I started to get more and more tools of what do I do with it when I'm there in the movie theater, or when I'm listening to music, or relationships. I was alone, 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 alone. And on my first date when I was 27, Holy Spirit said, now you're going to really see that unconscious skill come up. <laughs> Try a relationship. Oh, well that's... So between the music and the movies and relationships and whatever, that became my quest was to do anything I could. And so we share that. We, have, we share that on our, on our online ministry. In fact, everybody, you know, Ricky, when she came, it was like two and a half years of, of really like, Intense, you know, bringing it up. And Kirsten and I, when I first met Kirsten, she had, had two head injuries um, and she was receiving disability and, and was very sensitive to noises and, and all kinds of things. And, and you could say, going through that, that became how do we bring it up? And that was my. That's the fastest way past the karmic wheel I know, is bring the unconscious up into, into awareness. So I would say not only have I gone through it, but I've dedicated my whole life to coming up with the best ways to do it. And uh, the spiritual community is right in there. Everybody's seen it. Just ask the kid about Hawaii. <laughs> she has she had a very strict, some of them in Utah, but mostly in Hawaii. Yeah. But everybody's got their, can talk about their own little eras when they went through the major, major darkness. Yeah. Like the main thing is just, that is the prayer of the heart. Like, um, of course, the prayer of the heart is not even 
bring up the unconscious. It's just like wanting to be in the light so much, wanting to be, uh, wanting to know the light within. And it's not even like to the point where you can't even do anything. It's just like you, you recognize it and you feel like you're just being pulled within, like drawn within. And then with that usually, comes um, unconscious, like when, as soon as there's that experience of the light of God's love, like instantaneously all the unconscious comes up so, so strongly and to the extent of, uh, it depends on your call, like how, like how deep your call is and it like there's a really deep call to really wanting to go for it and not wanting, like, you know, my prayer was always, Spirit, make it swift, make it swift. There's just no, um, I didn't want to, like, take my time, so to speak. I want, it's just like, why wait? But there's just like something inside of you knows that there's literally a different world. Like, beyond this world is the world I really want, and it's, why wait? And so, um, when it came, so when there's that prayer, it's going to come up, and it's going to look the way it's going to look, and, uh, uh, what happened to him in my life, it was, it happened to be Hawaii. And up until then, it was just, you know, I went, just took my steps the way I did and everything. It, it seemed like, I don't know, like even the expression sessions that I've done them, but in the end, it's kind of like, I just could feel people would just like wait for me, you know, they wanted to honor my darkness or something, but then it's just like, they would sit there like, just holding their um, desire to laugh. They just like, it's just no one really took it seriously. It's kind of like, so, and so that went really fast. And then kind of like, I went, um, I was at some point, I was in this very place of extension. Like I was just like standing, I was hearing very well. And I was just like in the big, like, on the, I, I felt like I was on the very high wave, like, yes, like, yay, like, something was just, like, really the experience, again, this, like, this experience of, um, like, I am, like, I am David, actually. It was just like that David and I, we are, like, I had a taste of it when, when I first came to, um, to Utah for the first time, like, my first night, it was just, like, really, like, not separate, like same mind, like really. And then again, so that experience started to really accelerate again and again, and I was just in this really place of both, like I want to call it like enlightenment, just like this awakened mind, and I was like, yay, all for it. And right after that, I, you know, I got guidance to quit the job, but I kept hearing, I want you full time, I want you full time. I want you full time. I was like, yeah, that's right, full time. Like, so and I'm like, that means I need to quit my job. I was like, and I worked part time. I was like, okay, done, 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 guidance. And then, and then I got called to Hawaii, and I was just on this highway, but like what it looked like. This is what it looks like. Like I was on this highway, like woo. I get, I get to Hawaii, and it just felt like <laughs> drop all the way to the bottom. <laughs> like to the basement, as David calls it, the parable of the basement into pure, just unconsciousness. It was just um, all the whatever fears, like it was to the point like there was no, like, hmm. like expression sessions, they, it's kind of like it all fell away because you don't even know how, to, like you can't even express it because it's so right, so uh, there's nothing. It's not like, you, I'm projecting on you. I don't like you or something, none of it. It was just so, it was, you could just feel something within. It's like that darkness is not even outside of you. It felt like I was just like burning all the time. I would wake up and I'm like walking on fire. Like my everything is just on fire. I couldn't even describe it. There's the emotional pain, physical, everything, just everything and beyond. And, and that was unconscious, as far as I knew, like, that's, that was unconscious, it was just happening, and, um, and all there was, it was just trust, 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 and making no conclusions, and I don't, I, I don't remember much of it, really, rather than, uh, 
next thing you know, it's just done, and I felt like I was signed out, and I moved on, and and um, and the whole new world opened up. The, the world that I truly like, the world that I truly that what I truly I was coming to, what was calling me, just opened up, and I just which I always knew was true, but and that was like the whole point. That's why I didn't really. I never spoke about it really too much because I did, it's kind of like I didn't want to indulge in it because the truth was that I was going for the gift and the, um, the, the, for something I knew I was like, like I knew I must have it and there's nothing that could, um, that could stop me and then that was the gift so I was just like from then on it was just I naturally kind of, it was just something clicked, it was just like, mind shifted into pure extension, like extending, 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 this like, teach love, that is what you are, it was just not, and, and it's been pretty much, it's been non-stop, and sometimes it's just, there was a, at first, like a bit of a thought here and there, well, it's gonna stop, and again, there's gonna be some kind of more darkness, and, and then more and more, I just started, like, there's this recognition, it's never going to stop, like it's just never going to stop, and um, but all of it is, it's like due to desire of your heart, and the thing is, no matter what, um, no matter what happens, no matter how intense, like um, the pain might be, if there's that true desire, the prayer of the heart, you're going to be in that, like, you're going to be safe, like, the fact that it's coming up in such an intense way, it's a, it's a, it's a sign that it's safe. Something within, no matter what, something within the, uh, knows that there's a deep, 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 deep trust. Just so much trust that willing to drop any kind of ideas, any kind of concepts, anything. Just go with true, I do not know anything. Because in that place, there's not even guidance. There's nothing. It's just... Something just carries you through it, and just go it. Because something remembers there, just some total, total reliance on spirit, and yeah, and then uh, so yeah, it's just um, a symbol of um, how much do you want it, right? And of course, it doesn't have to be like that, right? Also, and uh, and uh, yeah, there's uh, it could be. It could this way, but from then on, it's like there's actually a few of us who uh, who have um, who have gone through this through high intensity, and so happened to be Hawaii. It's just one, but it's like one would go through this intensity and would leave, and then another one. It's just one at a time, one at a time, right? And uh, and then at some point we all gather together, and there's still a little bit of fear in the mind because you know. Hawaii, when they mention this in the And it's like, Hawaii, no, no, kind of a little bit like, Hawaii, no, I did not hear it, no, 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 Hawaii, but okay, a little bit. And then, uh, and then at some point I just started to hear it because the gift was, that's not the experience of terror, that's never the gift. The, cl like, the clarity of the mind, it's just like, I came out of it like a newborn, like a newborn, like a spirit, like just so pure. I didn't even like I didn't even remember. I don't even remember it. So I kept demonstrating that's the true, like the prayer of the heart. Only the truth is true, right? And then um, and then I started hearing because there's still a little bit of fear, and then I was just I heard it very clearly. It's it's done. That kind of thing. It's it's done, and it's not, and it's just not gonna happen again, it's truly, it has served. And also the gift was just, just you know, full trust, like given whatever, um, tr like it's trust that makes everything gentle. And so it's a bit like also a rock pool like that, so that every part that is trust, there's, if there's some kind of uh, places in your mind that we don't know about unconscious, that they're still hanging on, all of it was just very, swiftly just washed away and so from there on it's just total trust and it felt like ever since then it's just felt like a smooth 
a smooth, smooth, smooth ride, and then there's some, somewhere there's that gratitude. It's like, oh, you never. And the true experience, I've never been abandoned. There's nothing that can be lost because the fear of loss was just like so high. And uh, and like the course says, the journey. If if you truly take my hand, if you trust me the way I'm asking you to trust, the journey can be like um, a walk in the park. And it's like. And it is. It has since then. It has been like a really, like a walk in the park. There's just this experience that you're you're always being carried, and, and you're allowed. Like you allow that to happen, and that's where that soul gentleness is, because there's just that un uncompromising trust. You uncompromise, and you want to trust. It's kind of like you. Nothing's hanging on you. You know it. You know it within, and it's very joyful and. Um, and uh, yeah, and then there's no memory of anything being not that. It's just like there's, with Hawaii, there's been a lot of lately. Uh, the collapse or about it. We'll get together and be like, oh, Hawaii. And just someone will mention Hawaii. So I was Hawaii. It's, like, it's just it's, it's, it's just laughing because it's, uh, it, it's just really because there's that gratitude underneath. And it's like, you can't explain. It's kind of like if you haven't been there, you don't know that. But those who have, they've gone and they've received, and then and you take it with the clear mind, the clear, the clear mind, and um, yeah. And from then, it's, it's a walk. It's pretty much. It's just a very beautiful walk in the park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. That's so much for the unconscious. <laughs> and it's just, and the fear, you know, it's just kind of like, you're not afraid. It's just, there's no fear of that darkness. The experience, the gift is like, you know, the darkness is not real because it's kind of like, we go as much as we go, we trust as much as we trust. And then there's sometimes there could be that fear. But if I let this up, boy, like, there's going to be consequences. And there isn't. There is nothing that, you know, there is nothing that spirit cannot handle. There is nothing that, um, because there is nothing to handle. And it's like, we want to learn that. We really do. We, we, it's kind of like, like, you know, for karma, there's still, like, the thought of karma, there's still that <sighs> thought behind it that you have to earn your way back. Home. You have to earn, you, you have to be good now, you have to personally do something where the Course and Jesus teaches that you don't have to earn nothing because you haven't done anything. How could you earn something? It's given in every moment now. And so the experience is if you allow that, if, if, there's, if you're willing to really not back away from fear, if you allow that, the gifts are so apparent and in your face all the time and that's what's overwhelming because it's like there's still that thought I'm not worthy and God's like, oh yeah, the spirit is so like, well then you have another thing coming and it's just, and that's the, uh, uh, that's the, like that's the tears because it's like how could I be so wrong, like I was totally wrong and, um, and it's like, so much because the love, the love is so in the face and it's just never ending, it's never ending. And that is, like, that's the gift of it all. And so no matter what's going on, it's just, it's all, it's worth it. It's just that trust and going with it, it's worth it and knowing the prayer, just staying with the prayer of the heart all the time and, yeah. Like knowing that we do not need to earn anything. This is not the path of earning. This is a path like that's what I say. I call it. This is the path of the worthy. This is indeed a path of the worthy. And there isn't any. It's like there's a part of the mind that's like believes in punishment and wants to even prove that okay, punishment is real. Not going to happen. It's just going to be very tiring and. Um, because it's never going to happen. It's just you're never going to be punished. It's not. That's not. That's not what God is. That's not what we are. 
So, and, and that's what's true. That's the truth. It's really interesting too that, that the Course says the more that you look at fear, the less you see it. Really, meaning the more that you look at fear with the Holy Spirit, the less you see it. If you look on fear with the light, you're, it's going to disappear. But it's like, like he was saying, face it. To be willing to face the fear when it comes up and look upon it with the Holy Spirit, that's how it's, it's healed, it's transcended. It's not a matter of, I call this world, this cosmos, is like distraction though. You've, you've landed in distraction though, and there's a lot of distractions in distraction though. You can entertain, you can meditate, you can, you can find all kinds of worldly fantasies and pleasures to take your mind away from the simply facing the darkness when it comes up and, and allowing it to come up and then allowing it to, to pass through. That's what Hawaii experience was. And then, as you can see with the Kita, there's a confidence that starts to grow. There's a confidence, there's a certainty that grows stronger and stronger and stronger. I was down with her in uh, Mexico recently and uh, she came out one morning and she was all happy and she had this real confident smile on her face and she said, the ego tried to tempt me last night. She said with a big grin on her face. I said, yeah, I didn't have a chance. Did you? <laughs> now that's what you've got to, you've got to gain that confidence in the spirit. Trust would settle every problem now. Really going into that. Aligning your mind with the strength of Christ, the strength of the Spirit, knowing that you can handle anything. You can look upon anything. And, and that means you can look upon a holocaust. That means you can look upon a, a massacre. You can look upon what seems to be natural disasters and so on and so forth. Um, what was the movie that came out right around Christmas time about the, the tsunami? Oh, the right? Is it out? No, it was the one with, um, yeah, Naomi Watts was in it, and, um, yeah, yeah, that's it. The, impo the, the Impossible? Oh, that is. Okay. The Impossible. I, I mean, I, I'm always attracted to a title like that. I'm going to see a movie called The Impossible, because all movies are The Impossible, so yeah. why did they name one The Impossible? <laughs> no, I mean, so I go in, and it's it's a movie about the, the tsunami in, in Thailand that we it was just recent. And so I'm in there, and I'm I'm watching the movie with my Magoo mind, Mr. Magoo, uh, watching watching the movie, and it's you know it shows the family, Naomi Watts and and her husband and the children. They're playing in the pool, and and then the, the trees start shaking. Is it an earthquake? No, it's not an earthquake. It's a wall of brown water that's coming. And oh, the next thing you see, glass breaking and blood and bodies flying. And, and it's like you're there with the movie being hit with the tsunami, this huge wall that just rinses and washes everything. And I can say this movie was graphic. Silence of the Lambs, but he's nothing, nothing compared to this movie. It's called The Impossible. So anyway, I'm sitting there watching the movie in my state of mind, my Christ mind, and I'm like watching the movie and everything with my Christ mind. And my friend Frances, who some of you know, she was with me last time, she quickly started watching me instead of watching the movie. She was like, look at the screen, and people started heaving like throwing up in the movie theater. It was so graphic that people started, people started eating because it was that graphic. And it wasn't like just one scene, it's the whole movie. It's the whole movie after the pool scenes. And people are throwing up, people are walking out of the cinema. It's like graphic, graphic. It makes Silence of the Lambs. 
It looked like nothing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see this shots of the water, of the glass cutting, nobody wants the breast being sliced, and I mean, all kinds of, I mean, it was, and I'm there, <laughs> watching the movie, and, and Francis is watching me watching the movie, because she's hearing the evening, and they're going, look, God, look at this, I wish it, but the thing was, this is what we're talking about, I have given everything I see, all the meaning that it has for me, my meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world, it's not the, the shadows on the screen that make you throw up, is it? I mean, it's a bunch of shadows on the screen. It's just the same with Freddy Krueger or any horror movie, uh, Jack Nicholson, Red Rum, Red Rum, whatever. You know, all of it. It's none of the screen never scares us. It's all being generated inside our consciousness. And what is so scary except our interpretations? Our interpretations of frightenedness. We're scared because of our interpretations, and they're coming from what? Our thoughts. Where do our thoughts come from? They, are, they can't be our real thoughts that God gave us. They must be these attack thoughts that we have in the unconscious mind. And what are our thoughts coming from except our beliefs? We believe it's possible to separate from God. We have attack thoughts. We generate fearful emotions, and we project out images that are stories interpreted as fearful stories. That's what dreams and nightmares are. Those are night terrors. And it's whether we do it during the daytime or we have night terrors at night, our mind is generating the whole thing. So once you start to realize that, you start to realize that we've had everything in this world backward. Our ears don't really hear. We, we've been taught that there's like sound waves and they come in and they hit the eardrum, the signals go to our brain and the little neuro impulses. No. A trick. That's a trick too. Our ears are more like speakers. Our consciousness with the, through the body is, they're like speakers. They're projecting the sound out. The mind is generating the sounds. The ears are not receiving sounds. The ears are like, and guess what these little things are? We think the light comes in through the retina. Again, you know, it's inverted and all these things we've learned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've been lied to. It's mass hypnosis. We've been tricked to think that there's light coming into our eyes. These are projectors. These are being used by consciousness to project out an entire world. That's going to shake your world when you start to realize how you've been duped to believe that you're a human being. There's a world outside of you that's really out there. And it's coming, sound waves coming in, and light waves. Mm -hmm. Some of you might have seen the movie, What the Bleep? Did we know? It was teaching the same thing in there, just consciousness. Even the characters in our life are just acting out our thoughts and beliefs. And even those little peptides we have in our brain, where do you think those peptides are getting activated from? Consciousness. It's all in our mind. The entire world is in our mind. It's not out there. But the good news is, if the world is being projected from our consciousness, what if we forgive the attack thoughts? What if we change our consciousness from a fear-based consciousness to a love-inspired, forgiven consciousness, and then we see a completely different world? Don't you think that must have happened with Jesus? If he was on the cross and he was saying things, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That had to be a different consciousness. When you've got blood coming out of your arms and legs, you better be in a different consciousness, not the Catholic consciousness that tells you he suffered and died, because that's not it. If he had a healed mind, why would a healed mind suffer? That makes no sense at all. That's ridiculous. I know neighbors who walk on hot coals and their feet aren't burned. And this is Jesus Christ. For Christ's sake, I mean, you know, <laughs> the suffering Jesus, you know, very much a misperception. Pain is a misperception. Oh, are we running out of time? Uh, you are awesome. <laughs> I can't get it. I can't get it. I can't get it. <laughs> well, it's been fun. <laughs> and we're going to do more of this tomorrow.
Are we doing it here? Yeah. Yes, we'll be back. So one till six. We're just getting ripped up here. We're just we we're getting we're going past the duped part to like Nikita smiling, going, the ego tried to tempt me last night. <laughs> it wasn't fair. She's like, no problem. It's you again. <laughs> But see, that you want to get into the, the confidence of the Spirit. You want to feel the strength of the Spirit inside you. And so, and tomorrow I think we'll see what happens, but we, we will have a, a variety of things that will happen from one to six. So if, you, if you're free and you want to join us, please do. And thank you so much for showing up tonight. Whether this is your first exposure, this or whether you've been into spirituality for years and it's starting to trigger some interesting experiences, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And what my wish is for you is just happiness and joy and freedom. You know, you, you are worth it. You deserve it. You deserve to have a happy life. And then do the Truman Show. In case I don't see it, say to the world, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And that's the way to live this life, not to fear death and fear suffering and think that you, your life will end in pain and suffering and death, but that you will reach a state of mind where you can take a bow and say to the world, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, good night, and, and reunite with your Creator and live a life of eternal life. And that is worth it. That's worth every bit of forgiveness, every bit of, of facing the darkness and, and exposing it and releasing it.